Marilyn, in trying to discern what's the nature of our consciousness, the real ultimate nature of it, I'm told that a new field called transpersonal psychology is a way to understand ourselves more than ever before. Now, I understand the psi research and parapsychology, and I appreciate that field's potential uh, impact on the reality of consciousness, but I'm a little unsure on the, what transpersonal psychology brings to this party. William James, the great philosopher at the turn of the century and psychologist, talked about how any aspect of human experience is a valid domain for science. And he introduced this concept of a, a radical epistemology or um, a radical form of empiricism that would allow anything to become a data point. So in that, in that spirit, you can think about some prevailing views of psychology. And obviously the dominant view is that we are physical and that the problems we have, the, the experiences of unity that we might have, are simply some kind of biochemical, you know, display, <laughs> right? And on the other hand, there are many, many, many people throughout history, every culture, within our own culture, that report these kind of mystical experiences, these experiences that take us beyond ourself um, from the conventional psychological view, those are pathological. They're, they're negative, they're delusional. But in fact, what you can begin to see from William James's radical empiricist point of view is that we have something important to learn about the nature of reality by taking seriously these, these claims, these experiences that people are having. I've just completed 10 years of work looking at transformation and transformational worldviews. We interviewed 60 masters from different world traditions about um, how it is that change happens in their, their practice and what is the importance of practice. Uh, and ultimately, what are the results of these kind of transformations in worldview? And and one of the most common things that people described was a sense of unity, a sense of connection. Uh, it was a move from an individualistic I to a collective we. And that we was more encompassing than just we humans, but a, a broader sense of possibility. So let me understand this, that you interview and spend time with a, whole, a large number of practitioners of different worldviews, different religious traditions, philosophical traditions, subsets of those. Uh, all of whom had a, a kind of practice, a ritual or some process that you go through, meditation-like in some cases, I'm sure, and that the experiences that, that a devotee or some, a pr practitioner of that would get out of it would be a subject that transpersonal psychology would, would be able to study or to be able to, to uh, inculcate. To or appreciate. It's a way in which to begin to appreciate Rather the richness. Rather than dismissing it, uh, uh, which a traditional psychologist or might Medicaid. do. Or Medicaid. Instead of medicating, right, they look right, at right, actually right. what or are extirpate. the growth potentials of yes. this particular kind right. of experience. Is that something dangerous? Maybe they're, they're schizophrenic or paranoid and they're, 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 you know, they really do need some medicine. I think that's really valid. <laughs> I think there's sort of three different models you can hold to that. You can say all of these experiences are delusional, pathological. You can say all of them are on logically real and the worldview is just flawed so that it doesn't accept <laughs> yeah. it, or you can say it's a mixture of both. And if in, pack, in fact people are having these kind of unitive experiences or the knowledge of each other's thoughts and so on, um, that there are some dangers in that and there are some ways in which uh, we would want to be able to protect our, our privacy. For example, you know, we don't want everybody inside our heads right, all the time. Right, and if right. somebody thinks they're in our heads right, all the time, well, right. there's something probably wrong with them, yeah. you know. But instead of sort of taking it to that extreme, which if a person is experiencing dysfunction, if in fact it's too overwhelming or too um, uh, fragmentizing, if that's a word, mm -hmm. um, then I think that certainly the medical model is appropriate to begin to think about how to bring this person back into a sense of integrity and healing. But if, in fact, people are having these kinds of experiences, I, I have a, a dear colleague, um, Yasir Chadli, who's a Muslim, and he described one day uh, floating. He was a, a body surfer, and he was floating on the waves, and, and suddenly he just felt himself growing bigger and bigger and bigger until finally he had a direct personal experience of what Allah would talk about as one. And he suddenly had a first-person experience of oneness. 
Um, I think that that for this person within his particular worldview was a very enhancing life experience. It wasn't pathological, it wasn't delusional, it was something that ultimately propelled him to live a different kind of life. Most religious traditions have mystics or people like that who undergo a very similar experience within each of those worldviews. They have different belief system of, of some kind, but that expression of unity, of growing as part of the great cosmic consciousness or God is very similar among all the different views. I mean, it absolutely is. And it would tend to indicate that it's some, you know, sensory deprivation biology that kind of creates this. I would not at all rule out the possibility that there are neurophysiological, biochemical aspects to this. It may be that some people are predisposed to have these kind of mystical experiences. Does that mean that because their antenna, based on their biology, is more attuned to it, that it's nothing more than their biology? Or is it that they're somehow accessing realms of experience and reality that are true but simply not available to somebody who has a different frame of reference? You know, I I would comment that with uh, the default position being it's only biology because everything else is speculative with the burden of proof being on someone else who would make that claim. Uh, But that would be a hard position for me to defend against somebody who would claim just the opposite. In other words, what is the ground of being that you start from? I might have a tendency to start from the brain science because I was trained that way. And many people who start that way um, end up someplace different. And I think that we are dynamic, you know, permeable creatures that are capable of moving from one model to another. You're taking me someplace different? (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Let's see where we go. Close your eyes. Um, I think about this man, Dick Gunther, who I've worked with and who is a very successful businessman, uh, seeped within the, you know, capitalist, physicalist, materialist model. And uh, one day he stepped out on a deck overlooking the Pacific Ocean and had a fundamental shift in his experience of reality, fundamental change. That was 40 years ago, and it has never left him. Mm. It hasn't changed his engagement with his business pursuits or his home life, but it has imbued every action with a greater sense of meaning. So I think that the shift that transpersonal psychology offers is rather than pathologizing these experiences, to use them as an impetus for growth and for a greater sense of balance and integrity in our lives.